Welcome to Blurry Creatures. This episode is going to be fun. We have Luke, the Bigfoot scientist, Dr. Jeff Meldrum on the show today. If you have ever watched any Bigfoot documentary, you're going to see Dr. Jeff Meldrum on that Bigfoot documentary. He's been on everything. I think he was on Joe Rogan's second episode, actually. Did they do psychedelics together? That's what I'm going to ask Jeff psych- when he gets on. Did you guys, did you guys do DMT <laughs> and fly out of outer space? <laughs> Yeah, no, he's a big deal. He made Joe Rogan what he is today, and that's what's going to happen to our podcast. You think he's getting that hundred mil from Spotify? Oh yeah, man. That's how that that was my idea. Like, if we bring Jeff Meldrum on to Blurry Creatures, soon we're going to be getting a hundred million dollar deal from Spotify. No, I'm but, just thinking uh, we're going on Joe Rogan. You're doing the DMT, and I'm going to be, your, <laughs> and, and we'll just have to think of a safe word. There's no way I could do that. <laughs> but uh, Jeff Meldrum is like got all the science. He's a professor at Idaho State. It doesn't get any more scientific than what he's doing. Let's really preface the show, though, Nate. Like one of the things we're doing with this with this particular show, I think, is a lot different than a lot of these previous interviews with Jeff Jeff Meldrum. Is that we're bringing his son on as well? So this is going to be a family yeah. affair. We like to say it's a family show. We like to make it accessible for everybody, and I think we're going to have a fun little angle with and talking about the family affair when it comes to the the elephant in the room, who may or may not be Bigfoot. Let's get this going. All right, so welcome to the show, Jeff Meldrum and Son. Uh, Jeff, you're you're quite you quite literally put the track in track record. Speaking of your track record, you're an anthropologist, biologist at Idaho State University. You travel around the globe looking at castings and evidence for Bigfoot. You wrote a book called Sasquatch: Legend Meets Science, which explores the scientific evidence and tribal people's accounts and knowledge of the subject. Um, You published two field guides, one focusing on Sasquatch and the other on relic hominoids around the world, which has already come up a lot on our show already, the little people, so so they say. Uh Um, You also are editor-in-chief of a scientific journal, The Relic Hominoid, which is in that space too, where you try to get scientists and other people to research, share their research, and create a platform for the discussion. But uh, Sean, your son's also in this show, and uh, Sean, you're the more elusive guest on this episode. (laughs) Can you tell us a little bit more about yeah. yourself? Because I'm sure the Bigfoot people know your you know your dad real well. But yeah, we'd like to hear about yourself, and then we can hop into this episode and go wherever it takes Ooh, us. Oh well, um, we maybe should have started with me because I'm not as fantastic. But I currently reside in Boise, Idaho. I've lived here for two years. Grew up in Pocatello with my father. I have two children. I think thanks to my dad, I'm an avid outdoorsman. I don't know what else you want to know about me. Well, I just want to introduce you. I didn't want to leave you out. And I want you to be a big part of this conversation because when I was thinking about this, here's a little story about myself. Um, I played music professionally for about 10 years. And one thing I learned right away is that some bands have crazy fans. And if there's anything I know about the Bigfoot community, I thought, man, I bet you, you know, Jeff, you're like the rock star of the Bigfoot world. And I'm sure I was like, I bet you his son has some crazy stories about his dad. And I just thought this could be a fun episode where we could talk more about the beast in the room, the metaphorical beast of the, the Bigfoot community, the the skeptics versus the scientists. There's just so many things we could talk about. But I thought it would be good to bring you on this episode, Sean, and kind of have this discussion about what's what's the fans like in the Bigfoot community. And I'm sure you've got some wild stories already. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, growing up and hearing some of the stuff from my dad like oh the, i think the the fun the funnest one that i and he can shed more light on this because he's actually talked to him i just heard it from him but the the, the gentleman who would call in the middle of the night and <laughs> it, and it was really in the middle of the night it was about two o'clock and I, I, i'm pretty sure my dad would answer the phone i don't know correct me if i'm wrong but the guy that would talk about bigfoot being an interdimensional time traveler uh, made out of pure titanium. <laughs> Is this ringing a bell, Dad? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were just on the phone with him yesterday, right? No, no. He's he's passed. He's passed. Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, I don't need a phone. I don't need a phone, right? You just uh, tune into him. 
he uh no this was he was a very colorful character named by the name of eric beckjord he was one of these type of people who just did not uh, live a normal life and I, I honestly think he was insomniac i don't think he had a sense of what time it was when he would just uh, compulsively pick up the phone and give me a call. <laughs> and that one time when it was about two o'clock, my wife hands me the, the phone and I'd say, and I just very politely and gently said, Eric, do you realize what time it is? <laughs> and, and I don't think he did because he goes, Oh, Oh, so sorry. So sorry. And he hung up and he, after that, he never called me at home. He only called me at my office. He was very, very courteous, you know, but he was a, he was a strange, well, he had some strange ideas and, um, uh, was quite, um, quite controversial as a result of that. But, uh, you know, I, uh, in some people's minds, I have some strange ideas, so I'm always sympathetic to, yeah, yeah. to those people who do, as long as they're at least uh, somewhat sensible about it. But Yeah, I mean, so we, uh, one of my band's last big tours we did with Hanson, of all bands, and the Hanson brothers have some crazy stories of their fans, and their fans, I think, of all the bands we toured with, have the most... <laughs> rabid fan base some girls went to every show it was a 40 date tour and they were at every oh. <laughs> show and i can only imagine you're at bigfoot conferences and you've got people coming up to you wanting your autograph telling you their stories and i thought if, if, if he's experienced anything that i have it's it's probably crazy and there's some stories there <laughs> i mean that you the bigfoot community has embraced you fully you've been on so many documentaries that i've seen and you seem to not turn away um you embrace the community and i think that's a good thing because you're trying to bring some sense to it all and and not make it so crazy well you you, you overstated a little bit because it's not uh, it's not uh, with unanimity that i'm embraced by the bigfoot community because there are very differing opinions and and uh, different ideas and so i've uh, uh, and i've been pegged as as adhering to certain ideas some justifiably and some not but uh but it is it, it is funny how the 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 fandom how that manifests itself there there was one we were up in uh down at thanksgiving point in uh, utah and uh, uh i was actually i was pushing my father-in-law in his wheelchair we were going out to see the uh the, the tulip festival but out of the blue, this woman beside me suddenly recognized me, <laughs> and she just she was just beside herself with, uh, yeah. with excitement about it. But the but the funniest point well, uh, at that point, my wife just net gently nudged me away from the wheelchair and said, "You can catch up." <laughs> and off she went, off she went to leave me there. And I I, I tried to make it brief, but. The funniest thing, she says, oh, she says, I'm such a fan. She said, you you are just so special. She said, you know, if I were to walk in a room and Tom Cruise was there and you were there, I'd come and talk to you. <laughs> and I said, oh, Tom Cruise? And <laughs> she goes, she says, oh, if the Lord Jesus Christ was standing there beside you. <laughs> and I said, all right, let's, let's be real about this. <laughs> exactly. It gets really weird. Like people, uh, they, they feel like they know you. They come up to you. They're, yeah. they're oh, shaking, yeah. and they're like trying yeah. to get you know your autograph. I've I've seen so many weird experiences like that, and it's just kind of like okay. Oh, there, there was the guy who walked up to my table, and he was a little bit uh, seemed to be a little bit annoyed that I didn't immediately <laughs> recognize him, and he says to me very seriously, "Well, we are friends on Facebook." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, so, I love hey, it. I gotta ask Sean. So. Growing up with all with you know with your dad and what he what he's done and do you decided not to follow your dad into the family business of Bigfoot? Was it? Oh, <laughs> was there a reason or it wasn't your your cup of tea or? I, I yeah, well, biology wasn't my strong suit in high school. Yeah, that was actually kind of, that's kind of it. I didn't the the subject matter it didn't really appeal to me. I mean, I love going outside and. Uh, Are you a believer? Do you believe? Oh yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. you're fully in. So it's because sometimes you know the father son. Although hey, that's not recorded, right? <laughs> no, we do. It's, yeah, we turned it off. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> no, I mean I love it. If you got to embrace it, like if you know if there's enough evidence and there's nothing wrong with owning that belief. But sometimes you know, like with a lot of my friends, their their dad's politics, their son politics, they're they're the opposite. And I didn't know. Oh. I thought maybe is is because Bigfoot can be a family thing, like. 
Uh, my wife likes to sit down yeah. and watch the documentaries with me. And I've had some friends text me like, say, my wife will not talk about Bigfoot. If she, if I bring it up, she will walk out of the room. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> right? So do you guys talk about uh, Bigfoot around Christmas dinner? That's what everyone wants to know, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it definitely comes up. We all yeah. are like really our, – our family gets along surprisingly well compared to most, I think. Like I always brag about how me and my brothers are – I don't think we've ever had an argument that caused any kind of rift that lasted more than a day. We all get along really well. That's unusual. That's good to hear because I, <laughs> I can relate in some ways, man. Like I have uh, a couple famous brothers that do, you know, they both play played in the NFL. One still does play in the NFL, and it's interesting. Like I think the parallels I'm listening to this is like, you know, do we talk about football around the around the, the Christmas? And honestly, like after a while, we didn't. Like it just became like. It was, I don't know, it was just like a more interesting to talk about other things at some point. But I got crazy fan stories as well, man. Like just people interrupting your dinner and, you know, I don't know how it is for you, Jeff, but like in some ways it's crazy how just you being maybe in the public eye, just the expectation people have for you. You know what I mean? Like, they, like in some ways you owe them something or you owe them their, their two minutes or you owe them. Both my brothers for the most part are very, have been very gracious about it, but it, at some point it does wear on you. I know that for sure. I've, I have a lot of athlete friends that some aren't like Jay Cutler, for example, Jay's not the nicest dude ever. If you ever interrupt him when he's at, he's at lunch <laughs> or dinner, it's, it's not, you don't want to do that. <laughs> he's got a reputation for a reason. So, yeah, it is. I mean, you, 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 some people have certain expectations and so on. I mean, I uh, just kind of a case in point. I've I've always completely avoided politics with uh, and on my my Facebook page isn't my personal Facebook page so much as it is just a bulletin board for me to kind of keep uh, keep the Bigfoot community apprised of things that are happening or things that I find interesting. And and the other night I posted. Uh, something that uh, was political and oh my goodness the uh you know i've i've been uh, i've been uh, eliminated from the will and a number of <laughs> you got canceled <laughs> disowned by a number of people wow. um yeah with the kids it was always interesting because uh, you know the the kids were always very uh involved in athletics and with six boys you can imagine we had to be sometimes in uh, in five or six places at the same time on a Saturday morning. And so weekends when I was home and not out in the field, say during the summer months, some of the summer months were, uh, you know, were always consumed by um, soccer and lacrosse and such. And so we didn't have those, a lot of those weekend, um, uh, routine weekend outings to go bigfooting. But when we were out, I mean, the kids were always uh, very keen on, uh, identifying footprints and so forth. I, I remember this time, and I think it was Sean, in fact. Uh, we, uh, I think I know this story. <laughs> we, uh, down in Ogden, uh, in Utah. Maybe. There was, a, there was a gentleman who contacted me, and there had actually been a report up here near near Pocatello in Blackfoot on the reservation lands, and, and uh, some footprints were cast, and I was aware of that happening and tracked down some... Uh, eventually tracked down some newspaper coverage of it. But out of the blue, before that happened, out of the blue, I get a phone call from a fellow down in Utah, and he has footprint casts from this event. So we decided to make a, a day trip, went down um, to Ogden, and uh, you know drove through the mountains and had the boys with all, and, and uh, they were outside playing as, as this gentleman um, escorted me downstairs. And he was showing me his... Uh, hunting trophies and all his uh, gun cases. And he was telling me hunting stories. He'd hunted bear from Alaska to New Mexico and yada, yada, yada. And out come the footprint casts and he sets them on the ottoman and, and they were obviously bear. <laughs> and I was very gently trying to draw this realization out of him rather than just blatantly say it. Well, Sean, I think it was, was impatient and uh, was tired of what was going on upstairs with the kids running around the yard. He comes bopping down, walks right up to the ottoman and said, Dad, I thought we came here to look for bi or at Bigfoot tracks. Why are you looking at bear tracks? <laughs> and this man just turned about seven shades of scarlet. <laughs> this, you know, seven or eight-year-old uh, just really showed him up. And <laughs> so 
he, he hands me the cast and he says, here, just take him. You can use him in the collection. That's amazing. That's funny because my kids, I have a two, I have two boys. I have a, a six-year-old and a four-year-old. And already my six, six-year-old goes, Dad, are you doing your Bigfoot show? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know if my kid is going to want to go Bigfooting with me. So you have the luxury of that. Uh, yeah, it's funny. Like when you go out, you have all these experiences. Um, and it's a cool father-son thing to do together. Take your kids out. Yeah. Look for Bigfoot. And do you find um, people bring you other weird casts? Like you're talking about these bear, these bear prints, other yeah. weird cryptid creatures that supposedly exist. Do you get all that other stuff too, or is it just in the Bigfoot? Yeah, mostly Bigfoot. I mean, not not too much. I've I've done a couple of interviews. Like uh, there was one uh, where they they claimed they had a, a chupacabra footprint. And um, uh, and a, ca- a cast of that footprint, which they were bringing for me to look at. So, in preparation, I simply spread out on the on the uh, tabletop, um, you know, different uh, felids and canids, from uh, cougar to bobcat to coyote to wolf to domestic dog, and it, it made a really great visual because I just took this cast of the of the quote unquote <laughs> chupacabra and and went slowly along this line you know going ding 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 domestic dog just as clear as it's just a dog they didn't appreciate the sound effect i think they cut that out hey sean like when you've been out with out in the woods do either with your dad or doing it on your own have you ever found any footprints on your own and What's that feeling like if you have or if you haven't have you been there when they've been found no we i don't think no, I don't think we've ever been on an, a on a trip or outdoors and found casts. Although we always, like my dad said, we always brought the the casting materials. Um, but I think the best thing that we ever cast was um, the an impression of somebody's backside that we found <laughs> in the, in the mud. Do, dad, do you still have that in your collection, or did you finally get rid of it? Oh, I have a, a, a an actual one, a real one. A real backside? Yeah, a real, that's amazing. Yeah, a real backside, a real Bigfoot, Bigfoot backside, yep. A buttock, <laughs> as uh, Chris Stump would uh, say. Is that the NSFW collection that we, we don't doesn't come out very often? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it actually is, is, is quite interesting because uh, the fellow who found it and cast it quite, quite uh, expertly, in fact, uh, I mean, to the to the point that you can actually see hair striations down across the cheeks and the backs <laughs> of the of, the, of these uh, very broad thighs. But um, you know, he goes, "I don't know if it goes this way or this way." And I looked at it and I said, "Well, that's the tailbone, right there. You can see the tailbone. You could actually see a sphincter just as plain as day." Oh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and these very muscular cheeks, you know, and hold, holding the what we call in anatomy the natal cleft open, uh, so the cheeks are spread just a little bit, and these big, uh, broad, hairy thighs. But I mean, to see the the hair striations that come down across the cheeks, and then the bare skin in the cleft, and the very hairy thigh. I mean, it was it was impressive. The what what Sean was talking about, we we did. <laughs> this is awesome. We found an imprint in the in the snow and mud on on a hike just up here locally, and uh, and the kids were joking because it did look just exactly like someone had sat down or something <laughs> had sat down there. And uh, so I remember that that evening it was actually on the Fourth of July, and we were up on the hilltop to watch the county fireworks at the fairgrounds, which you could see from our hilltop. And the kids were telling one of the little neighbor boys about what they had found. And at the top of his lungs, he goes, you found Big Butt? <laughs> <laughs> and, then he, and then he went and stopped saying that. It was really funny. <laughs> so you threw this cast away. You still have the butt cast, I hope, right? Oh, I yeah. The one I described, I certainly have. The the one that Sean remembers, we didn't actually, I don't think we actually made a foot uh, or a cast of the oh. imprint. Okay. Yeah, we got to be wrong. I thought we did. I don't. I don't have it in my collection. (laughs) So this is really. I mean, you have the only known cast of of (laughs) Bigfoot's anus. (laughs) I mean, you just never know what you're gonna learn on. Yeah, that's uh, that's probably true. Oh, Bigfoot butt. Yeah, you have over 300 of the of the castings of the foot, right? 
That's right. That's right. And those and those listening, you have the picture of Patty on your wall in your office behind you right now. So I just got to <laughs> say, you're the real deal, Jeff. You have <laughs> you have those casts, right, of Patty? I have some of them. Yeah, not not the originals, but uh, re- replicas. Are those and- like locked in a case somewhere with like a? guard protecting them 24 7 the moon landing f- tapes and all that stuff no <laughs> no actually um there there's a one one set of originals is uh, curated at the uh, china flats willow creek museum in uh, willow creek california wow and um some of the uh very high quality high definition molds that that uh, grover krantz made dr grover krantz made of the originals are now accessioned at the Smithsonian in the Department of Anthropology. What? And uh, the original pair that were cast by Roger Patterson on the day of the filming are still in the possession of his his wife, his widow, who survives him. And uh, yeah, I've I've seen photos of those, and um, hoping for the opportunity at some time in the future to make good, high quality. Uh, casts uh, replica casts of those uh, they actually those two and and the the additional 10 that were cast by Bob Titmus constitute the 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 what we call the ichno taxon the type specimen of footprints for the sasquatch and and the the di- differential diagnosis and description of the distinguishing characteristics that set this species apart are uh, based on that as the type specimen and all other materials then are referred to that. So you have 12 tracks? You have 12 tracks from that, that event? 12, 12 tracks, yeah. Okay. And a few have popped up in addition. Because they're, they're, other people on their own uh, hearing about the event went out there and some of the uh, Bluff Creek uh, film site tracks have, have popped up uh, largely due to the, um, the notoriety of um, Cliff Berrickman from Finding Bigfoot, okay. the town hall meetings that they held down there brought a lot of people out of kind of out of the woodwork, and some of them produced footprint casts that they had made themselves. So a couple of additional ones have been added to that. Same yeah. So in your mind, I mean, obviously the skeptics think that's a you know half people think still think that's a guy in a monkey suit. I know. Yeah, I know. It's uh, here we are fifty years later, and uh, more than fifty, and it still is uh, is. Uh, is, is deemed controversial. It's, you know, you to really understand and appreciate it. I mean, not only do you have to have uh, some sense of anatomy and look and locomotor adaptation of of primates and early hominids, but you also have to know the the historical context, like so many things, the historical context of the events that influenced the way they were perceived and interpreted. And back in 1967, anthropologists were kind of stuck in the notion that human evolution uh, transpired as a just a linear single file march towards humanity, and that there were no other collateral species because there could, you know, the ecology tells us that um, there can be only one species in a given niche, right? And so we fill the bipedal, brainy, tool using hominid niche, and so. We, don't, we just can't share it with anyone else. So not only in 1967 did they not even, they couldn't even acknowledge the possibility that such a thing existed. And so in their minds, it had to be fake. So they had to look for reasons, you know, uh, to as to why it was fake. Funny how, how that uh, uh, colored the interpretations as a result. My One of my favorite examples, uh, Dr. John Napier was a primatologist at the Smithsonian. At the time, the film was brought to be seen by U.S. scientists for the first time. And of those who viewed it, he was probably the more open-minded individual but than most. But still, I mean, so much so that, that uh, five years later, he published a, a seminal book on the subject that one of the few books by a bona fide uh, you know phd scientist and uh, and especially a uh, primatologist but when it came to the film he he was unable to accept it and although he acknowledged he couldn't put his finger precisely on the reason why he had to reject it but except perhaps that when he looked at it he said from the waist up it looks essentially like an ape but from the waist down it looks like a human with these long legs he said it was just inconceivable 
that such a, a hybrid, such a combination, a chimera existed in nature. So it had to be fake. Well, just a few years later, um, the, uh, the uh, skeleton of Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, was discovered. Our first real glimpse of a more complete Australopithecine skeleton. And how is it described in the press? Isn't this interesting? From the waist up, it looks like a chimpanzee. From the waist down, it looks like a human. Mm, yeah. And so, you know, what if, what if Napier had waited just uh, four or five years before he published his book? Would, that was the linchpin for him. That, that unexpected combination of traits. And yet now we understand that's exactly uh, what early hominins looked like. And yet in 1967, they didn't know that. Right. You kind of hint at something that I think is always the conversation when it in involves Bigfoot. Um, it isn't really about Bigfoot. It's about just all this bias that you have about any subject that you bring in. And people say that scientists, they operate with this unbiased in this unbiased fashion. And I'm like, no, they don't. They bring their they bring their <laughs> beliefs into it. Can you talk about that? Just like what you're up against? Because it doesn't matter. It seems like it doesn't matter how much data you have. You could have hair, scat, mountains of, of data. And one of my questions to add on to that is if we were talking about any other animal, if you had all this data on like a marsupial, would science recognize this with how much evidence you have instead of a Bigfoot, you know? Well, yeah, the... the uh the, the sort of paradigm that I, that I described, even though it has been subsequently overturned, we now know that human evolution is a very bushy tree with lots of terminal branches, and, and, uh, and many of those branches have persisted until much more recently than would have been acknowledged 50 years ago uh, as even a possibility. And so, um, and so although there's been a, a shift we still have the generation from the time when that paradigm, the single species hypothesis or paradigm it was called, when that prevailed, uh, it, it still casts a shadow. And so you get, uh, you know, you get people uh, who are still my age say uh, that, um, that say things like there, there was a colleague of mine who said, uh, we, we had been invited, uh, another co-author and I had been invited to write kind of a state of the science of Sasquatch for the California Academy of Science uh, publication, their official publication, which we provided for them a very good, uh, I thought, a very good synopsis, but it was rejected because of the um, opinion of the uh, scientific advisory board. And when I pressed for a justification for that or a rationale, basically all that she was willing to provide was they can't exist, therefore they don't exist, and it doesn't matter what evidence they think they have. And I think, in my mind, that, that's a scientific approach to a subject or to a question, <laughs> hardly. Well, this is the argument I've made to a lot of my friends. You know, I went to school. I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and a lot of my friends went on to grad school. And they think I'm crazy for doing a Bigfoot podcast. Like, <laughs> like, what are you doing? And, and and I'm just like, I'm just trying to have normal conversations, and I think there's a lot of science there. I think when you use science back at academia, you're using, the, you know, you're – in a way, you're using what they want you to use, but it's still not enough. Um, yeah. Why, what, why well, the skepticism? Like, yeah. like I said, if it's any other animal, yeah. would they have acknowledged the existence of the species? Right. Well, sci science is uh, historically uh, and traditionally extremely conservative. And that, for the most part, has served it well. Although it has uh, heaped up roadblocks to certain certain uh, revelations and discoveries and so forth. It, uh, you know, it's kind of a, uh, you, you strive for a balancing act between, between that open-mindedness and who was it, Sagan, Sagan that said, uh, or Shermer, I'm not sure which one. Yeah, it's great to be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brain falls out, basically. Right. Um, which is kind of a silly Silly statement uh, for someone like that to make, but uh, nevertheless, you know, your, your comment about some marsupial or, or whatever, I think the, the only difference that, that I 
see as a as a rationale is that um, you know when when there's the discovery of a new species of a well understood or well established uh, group of organisms. So there's you know one new marsupial to add to the litany, um, but we are dealing here with something that is rather extraordinary. I mean, I think it's becoming less so in light of the ongoing revelations of paleoanthropology, you know, new fossil species is added to that bushy tree almost every year lately, it seems. It's almost an annual event to announce the discovery of a new fossil hominin. And so given the plethora and, and given the recency, a lot, a lot has been done, uh, has been said about uh, um, Homo naladi that uh, has gotten a lot of attention because it was a surprise when they finally nailed down the, the uh, estimated age. It was only a few hundred thousand years old. These creatures were around when Homo sapiens did appear. So, I mean, just to add on that, we've had several guests yep. on the show. We had one guy that had 700 newspaper documented uh, accounts of giants being dug up in North America. And, uh, yeah. um, and he had some with d- dwarves. Like 30, 40 mm-hmm. dwarves buried in them. It's like the Lord of the Rings. The more we keep doing this, all of our guests yeah. have talked about the little people. And do you yeah. do you find that that's not too far fetched? Well, sure. The uh, you know, in the discovery of the Hobbit, Homo floresiensis, you know, which also evokes that Lord of the Rings world with all these different uh, different beings uh, coexisting. Um, the discovery of that diminutive hominin that uh, presumably went extinct, ostensibly went extinct uh, a mere 50,000 years ago. And yet even the discoverers, you know, the very conservative anthropologists that they are acknowledge that, well, eh, the local people have been telling us these stories of little hairy people up in the mountains all along, but we, but they're just mythological, of course, or are they, you know? And so, um, you know, there's there are uh, accounts of these little people all across Southeast Asia hmm. in an area where it may be, at least the fossil record now suggests, that some of these Australopithecine types perhaps uh, may have persisted until very recent, if not uh, contemporary times. And so, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like, <clears throat> In the face of so much evidence, you know, n- now that this paradigm has been turned on its head and the notion that there have been uh, other non-sapien hominins living alongside us until very, very recently. I mean, you know, when I, when people are amazed when I rattle off, you know, there's evidence of Neanderthals, at least about 20 to 30, if not there's one site that has been suggested preliminary only 10,000 years old. There's Homo heidelbergensis in East Asia, 20,000 years. The Hobbit, Homo floresiensis, only 50,000. We've got remains of Homo erectus in some of the islands of Southeast Asia, like Java, perhaps as young as 25 to 75,000 years ago, and so on and so on. I mean, there's there's a, a half a dozen. If you if you stepped into a time machine and went back just 20 to 30,000 years for sure. Um, you could possibly bump into any of one of a half a dozen different upright bipedal hominids. And it's, uh, you know, so given that and, 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 and understanding and considering that on the one hand and on the other, seeing this mountain of evidence that you talk about, um, the footprints, the hair, the sightings, the vocalizations, all of these things, why should we, I mean, it's not like that stuff is in a vacuum anymore. It has a context. It has a, it has a cubicle <laughs> to give it rational um, significance. And, uh, and, you know, I don't expect science to recognize on, on the basis of that evidence alone. I mean, traditionally, it's required a, a, a type specimen in the form of a body or a diagnostic piece of a body or maybe um, this might be a good test case, um, a novel DNA sequence. That's never, there's no precedent yeah. for that, for recognizing a new species on that basis alone, but. Well, Sean, you were telling me a little bit about like kind of being in Boise and have, dealing with some skeptics and people kind of getting um, feisty with you. Can you talk a bit about that? Because I, I want to bring you back into this conversation. Like what you. Yeah, I had a question. I wanted to add on to that, Sean, before you answer that as well. 
I just was thinking about the experience. Like, so I, there's not too many people who probably from growing up from a kid, from a kid's age had not only an expert, but the belief that like Bigfoot's real. So you, you grew up being like, oh yeah, this is a real thing. Like your, your dad's the expert, right? Like I don't, a lot of us or, or ish, you know what I mean? A lot of, to me, I think about like, like Nate and I can like grew up in the church, right? So you always, at some point that gets challenged, right? like you get to high school or whatever, right? And that gets challenged. And so you've, it's gotta be a unique experience, man. Like just because I think for us, at least for me, I don't know where Nate's at with this, but like with the Bigfoot thing, it's been a process of, of just looking into it. But yeah. when you grow up in that, I don't think a lot of people had that experience. Oh yeah. Well, I think what happened with me is anytime a skeptic would approach me or, or address it, I'd be like, well, I just don't think you know as much as I do or have been exposed to as much as I do. And so, and this is even before the internet carried as much ease as it does now, but um, I would encourage people to go onto certain websites that would help them discover more. Or I, I always, I probably, well, I probably sell more of my dad's books than most bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and it just comes from me saying, you know, you, just, you don't have the same material that I grew up with. I had the Bigfoot encyclopedia right next to me and I would come home and ask questions and then I'd go back to my friends or the skeptic and I'd deliver information. And, and then I think that's how I curtailed a lot of, you know, heated discussions or, or really negative skeptics. Um, but no, it was kind of fun. Like I always liked, I think, I think most of me and my brothers growing up in a family of educators, my mother's a teacher, my dad's a teacher. We all are kind of teachers and we enjoy sharing information. So I think that helped too. People started to look at me as a, as much as of a, a wealth of knowledge as they would like my dad, the professor. So, well, it's it's a very unique blend of you, what you guys have because you're totally embracing academia, and but at the same time you're super open minded mm-hmm. and you create a riff. I'm sure you probably when you're walking to class, Jeff, you're like talking to the philosophy professors a little bit more than some of the other guys because you know you, you like to you're, you're dealing with the the idea of beliefs, right? And people just they they shut down, like you've said on a couple of podcasts. <laughs> listen to people have this irrational just visceral at you like no I, you know they, like almost anger it sounded like you were describing yeah. share some stories about just the instant negativity you get, you're getting back on this because I, I think that's fascinating yeah. that people are so closed minded that they'll just they'll almost get angry at you you know right well it's it has changed a lot it's mellowed a lot here on on the campus and uh, uh, well I don't know if, if it has if, if I can say how broadly that extends but some of my more vocal uh, antagonists are no longer here at the university and and then some of the tagalongs uh, without the instigator are are just ambivalent now but um, yeah there there have been some very you know you know nasty uh, uh, tit for tats I mean so much so that at one point uh, the university president during a general faculty meeting without mentioning any specific names, admonish the faculty to exhibit uh, uh, tolerance and respect for one another's research. Uh, he encouraged faculty not to say negative things about their colleagues in print, you know, or in the paper and wow. press. And, uh, and I, I happened to be out of town that week, but uh, it was reported back to me that it was quite clear to everyone in the room exactly who they were talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There was one particular uh, individual. He still is around. He's he's kind of given up on, on it though. But uh, he writes a local column, and uh, now well now he doesn't have a column. He just has well he has a column on the on the opinion page on Sundays now. But uh, he's got an opinion about everything. And uh, I was his kind of whipping boy for a long time. Bigfoot was Bigfoot just epitomized all things that were silly, and in his mind and irrational. And so it, it was, there was always an, uh, just an off the cuff or a tongue in cheek comment or allusion to my work. One, one week, I guess the news cycle was pretty slow and Easter was coming up. And so his column was entitled uh, Bigfoot and the Easter Bunny. And he, 
he basically his, his thesis was I would be as justified researching and and investigating the existence of the Easter Bunny as I am as an academic looking for Sasquatch. Wow. And then to cap it off, somebody he he was a he was an instructor in the physics department. wasn't even regular faculty. He was an instructor. Somebody in the physics department. Uh, brought in one of those um, lawn statues of Sasquatch <laughs> that you used to see in the Sky Mall uh, yeah. magazines uh, catalog, <laughs> Sky Mall. and and so and and I don't know if it's still there, but for years it was in the physics office. The Bigfoot holding an Easter basket. They they oh, yeah. they uh, balanced an Easter bag over its arm with uh, you know full of plastic Easter eggs. I guess as an homage to me, <laughs> <laughs> you got some but, trolls. Uh, you know, it was it it, it degraded to that sophomoric <laughs> level of expression, and wow. it was just. Uh, oh my god! Now I think you know they, I, I you know I, I hope that I've been successful at maintaining a <laughs> level of professionalism and and uh, you know a standard of objectivity in my treatment of the subject. Do you think you would have been fired if, if you were a younger professor or didn't have job security? Yeah, I was naive enough and idealistic enough, I guess, naive more than idealistic, maybe, <laughs> but that I, that I jumped in the deep end of the pool even before I had tenure. Wow. And uh, tenure was a bumpy, bruising, <laughs> bloodying process, and uh, I had to fight tooth and claw. And... Uh, and it also uh, delayed my promotion to full professor. That's brave. And and became a very unseemly process that involved, uh, you know, formal grievances against particular faculty and so forth uh, because of misconduct. And, and uh, so I, thankfully, those things are hopefully now in the past. At least I, they feel like they're in the past. Yeah, it's it has brought a lot of positive publicity for those that will recognize it that don't get get their own insecure wear their insecurities on their sleeve they recognize that it has brought a lot of right, attention right. and i've had many an instance where um you know where uh someone um encourages their their child to come to isu because i am at isu not necessarily <laughs> to study with me but there must be a an atmosphere of open-mindedness now the opposite really uh, strikes a nerve when uh, <laughs> there was a period when uh, there was an AP report, right when my book came out. And uh, an AP reporter came over from Boise to do a story. And he was a young, ambitious guy. You know, the story was supposed to be a, a serious professor writes a serious book about a subject that's rarely taken very seriously. <laughs> and and uh, instead, he sniffed out what he thought was a much more salacious story that would get him on the wires. And that was, uh, you know, this weird Dr. Meldrum, the way the story opened. I mean, just to set the, set the tone, it, it went something like, yeah, Dr. Meldrum, something of a hulking figure himself lurking in his dimly lit lab, shunned by students and faculty alike as he crosses the campus. You know, is that, was that kind of, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Sean, could you talk a little bit more about some of the heat your dad's taken? Um, I was a member of a local club at the in Pocatello, and there was a gentleman from the physics department, actually. Most of the club was very intrigued by Bigfoot. I think dad knows exactly what I'm talking I'm not going to say anything else yeah. about him. But yeah, but yeah, he, <laughs> <laughs> but he, yeah he, anytime that would be brought up, he would always... I could see him kind of puff up and there was only one instance that he really kind of got into it. Not necessarily with me, but he was sitting at the table next to me and he was just talking about uh, the, the nature of it. And, uh, and I could, he did it. I, I don't know if it was intentional, but he did it. He was sitting less than eight feet away from me. So, I mean, he's social distance from me, but it wasn't, <laughs> he, he, he wasn't out of earshot. And, uh, and the sad part was, was the club actually asked my dad to speak yeah. and my dad came and spoke and the entire club and guests, because everybody invited their friends, were there except for him. So it was, it was pretty obvious, but yeah. It's... I, I got to ask though, like both you guys here, like 
in your opinion, I have a theory on this, but like in your opinion, why do you think there's this this topic and this, this Bigfoot elicits such an emotional or strong response from people? Uh, more so than you would think like other, Nate kind of covered it a bit of it, like other areas of science, but it really, this is like such a hot button for some people. And what, why do you Why do you guys think that is? Yeah, uh, I think it's because it gets lumped in with a lot of uh, other things like, you know, you see it paired right next to Loch Ness and, and other things like Chupacabra. But I think another piece is the, the kind of the religious aspect of it. So Pocatello sits right up next to a, a tribe and um, my dad's become very kind of buddy with them and they're willing to talk. And I used to work for a company that, that was inclusive for the tribe to join. It was a financial institution and, and I'd hear about it a lot and you'd get mixed reviews where you don't talk about it. And then I'd get lots of people who were like, oh yeah, we love your dad. He's the best when it comes to talking about the respect and the sanctity of this mystical creature. And so that kind of, I think, drives that side of it for sure. I think it's such a hot button because it is so close to us as humans, right? It's 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 something that's very, very close to, Jeff was kind of touched on it before, like it's, some people don't want to address that that there could be some parallel or, a, a, you know, another branch of, of a hominid. And that thought alone elicits the, like right. a very visceral response from people that, right. that don't want to open their mind to that. Or admit yeah, that I, your, you know, 10th great grandfather was a, <laughs> was a, a, a different species possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I think my room, I think my room, one of my roommates. Is <laughs> <right>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've actually had a couple of people who who were were very um, explicit in expressing that concern was uh, or that if it were recognized, then it would prove evolution, and they perceived evolution as a threat to their religious belief. And so, uh, yeah, there 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 is that. It's it's off. It's usually more subliminal, I think. Than that, but but some people, yeah, think think that think that it somehow it uh, it reiterates that uh, this is a missing link, you know, and and that it it uh, indicates that uh, that we evolved from something else and and we're not specially created, and 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 they see it as a as a threat to that uh, position. But mm-hmm. my, I mean, that's like I said, I think that e- either it's more subliminal or. Uh, or uh, implicit that uh, it doesn't um, manifest itself as much as in the intellectual circles uh, in academia. It's it's basically uh, you know uh, well it's a combination. It's hard. To, some of it is as Sean said. It's it's out of ignorance, mm-hmm. um, and that yeah. goes for my own colleagues. You know right. uh, who who. Uh, uh, adopt an opinion without consulting the primary data, mm. and that's a problem. So, um, but it also uh, is uh, it, it. It's been so stigmatized as being quote pseudoscience. You know, there are these um, career ideological skeptics. You know, the Michael Shermers, the Benjamin Radfords, the Carl Sagan's who. You know, if you if you read the Demon Haunted World, you know it was a very, very popular and very influential book, and it was it was a great book. Except, in my opinion, it, it he lost some credibility and in, in some standing, in my view, because he just simply lumped all these phenomena together, regardless of any um, you know discretion or discernment about the difference between the evidence for Sasquatch, a biological entity, and parapsychology, you know. That's why it's a little bit problematic for me when I, when, you know, we talked about the lack of homogeneity and unanimity across the uh, Bigfoot community, because there are, uh, there's a, a, a very distinctive rift that has developed here of late between what, what are labeled the woo those who attribute paranormal explanations to Sasquatch and, and those that are the flesh and blooders, the biological entities. Uh, Something that 
something that we've kind of dug up in this podcast already is just this idea. I, I think that ancient humans weren't this close minded about <laughs> things. Like, I feel like we live in a time where we're the most close minded we've ever been as a, as a species. I, I think so. Yeah. Part of me wonders if as we've gotten to this age of science where everything's so black and white, I mean, is there anything in this space that's hard for you to believe? Because if, if, with any belief, there are things that you, you struggle with. Are there anything in this space that you struggle with yourself? In, in this, the Bigfoot space we're talking about? Yeah. You know, I, th- there are occasions when, when uh, you, you know, on a, a moment uh, of uh, uh, reflection where you think, man, are we ever going to get to the bottom of this? <laughs> I, I, I really don't doubt. I mean, I, I, any time uh, a, uh, a little doubt uh, comes and lights on my uh, head, um, I, I'm immediately reminded of, of the remarkable evidence that I have experienced firsthand or that I've examined, that, that I have assembled and collected and analyzed. And, uh, you know, people ask me, what's the best evidence? And, and, you know, we keep coming back to the footprints from my perspective. The, the subtleties of detail of anatomy and biomechanics Yeah, I heard you say something really good about this. You said there's only a few people in the world that could fake these foot footprints. Yeah, yeah. To to incorporate the the level of subtlety of of anatomical detail, uh, the and, and to even anticipate and think, because many of these footprints, as this, as we've said of the Patterson Gimlin film, I mean, they span half a century now at least, and yet this remarkably distinct. Th- these are not just um, enlarged facsimiles of a human foot; they are the foot of a heavy bipedal hominoid and they show all the distinctions that now in hindsight we would understandably expect but a lot of that biomechanics especially the biomechanics of human locomotion in 1967 really was in its infancy Hmm. i mean especially in academia i mean there there was perhaps a little uh, more advances um, uh, on the fore in um, in orthopedics and in medicine in rehabilitation um, professions, but um, you know the understanding of something like the mid tarsal break that I've talked about, you know, and and, and yeah. now people banty it about as if it's uh, just a common, common everyday term. But uh, when I was talking about it, there probably were only about a, a half a dozen to a dozen uh, anthropologists who could give you a rational explanation of what the mid-tarsal break yeah. was and its functional significance. And you can, and you can prove that because of the, the cast of Patty, where you literally have seen the video of the footprint. You have the footprint, right. you know, it's not one foot walking in the other, oh, right. like a knuckle walking oh, or absolutely. something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And it's been reiterated by dozens and dozens of other examples. And it's been, uh, further substantiated by other lines of evidence, like the half tracks, where when they run, they're up on the just the fore part of the foot, not just the ball, like in the human with our arched foot. Yeah. Um, uh, furthermore, by examples of pathology, where uh, like the the remarkable cripple foot, uh, which itself is controversial, but when viewed from this perspective, uh, of the 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 dis- differences that you see in the foot manifest in this deformity are perfectly aligned, correlate perfectly with the uh, distinctions of the normal foot anatomy that uh, uh, characterize the Sasquatch foot. Jeff, what was the turning point for you? Like, if you look back at the history and the evidence you've collected, at what point were you like, this is, this, this is it. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in on, on what I've seen. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I was kind of fortunate that the, uh, it wasn't the first contact uh, from an academic, you know, as an academic. It was actually kind of the second, but, but it was uh, coming up face to face, being taken out and shown a long line of footprints, 35, 45 clear footprints in the mud, no ambiguity. They were either hoaxed or they were real. And 
I can remember just literally the hair standing on my neck as, as the, you know, the significance of these footprints and the details I was looking at sank in. My gosh, you know, it was, it was like I, <laughs> I compare it to that uh, M&M's commercial where Santa Claus comes in or, or the two M&M's come in and catch Santa in front of the tree. And Santa, <laughs> they do exist, you know, yeah. <laughs> and vice versa. Where was this? When you that was in southeastern Washington, just outside of Walla Walla, so up against the Blue Mountains there. That uh, was this in '96. This was '96. Yeah, a lot of good onions yeah. up there. No yeah, they have great onions onion up onion. there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what about a lot of people ask? You know, with with this, what about the supernatural stuff that kind of comes in this space? I know that science, you know, yeah. it's not going to touch that. But as well, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I I would. Uh, you know, cite that common phrase, uh, you never say never, never say never, but a, a couple of distinctions. One, one is I, I sort of draw the line with my own involvement uh, at that which I can objectively evaluate. And, um, you know, I've, I've gone out, I've, I've welcomed the opportunity to have subjective personal experiences with such phenomenon, but every time I, I'm a, uh, a participant, nothing happens. <laughs> Nothing's observable. <laughs> so to go out and see an orb, orbs of light, or to to, to witness a, a portal materialize. You haven't been abducted yet. <laughs> I haven't been, at least not to my knowledge. <laughs> I do have this uh, back here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! I'd explain. Well, that. well, Bigfoot kind of gets into that weird space where people say they see the glowing eyes. Yeah, and. We do have examples in, yeah. in in the world of like animals like cuttlefish, where they can totally change right their appearance. And yeah. you think, and some people say Bigfoot does. They they cloak. Well, yeah, I've heard you. I bet you've heard all of it. All the yeah, sure. Stuff. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There was a great. Uh, there was a great uh, screenplay too. I, I was asked to read and comment on where <laughs> they had incorporated something like that. The Bigfoot could actually. Um, uh, change their appearance by a similar sort of chromatophore mechanism and just blend in, you know, like like uh, predator. Just I was about suddenly. to say that sounds like predator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Oh, um, Is that out of the realm of science, though? Could that happen? Well, it's not. It's not uh, out of the realm of possibility. If, if you can point to another example in the animal kingdom of something that utilizes that kind of uh, uh, adaptation. Then it's possible, but then then comes the second half. The other side of the coin is: is it probable? So when we look at the adaptive radiation of primates, and, and which includes us, and uh, you know what examples are there of anything that even even remotely? I mean, why is it that this interdimensional, this supposed uh, interdimensional time traveler, shapeshifter, always looks like a bipedal hominid you know <laughs> yeah exactly and uh, and doesn't pick up after himself in the woods you know <laughs> <laughs> but but, how, but why do you think we can't catch him then like because that's what a lot of people say it's like how can we 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 know all the other primates we can get close to them well, it's it's the combination i think of of uh, their elusivity and rarity uh, this is one thing that people don't give sufficient acknowledgement to if if they you know those who uh, who allow for the possibility that such a creature exists. Um, you know, I w without going into all the the uh, uh, logical uh, sequence of clues and and inferences and iterations and and uh, extrapolations that I've used to c arrive at this. These creatures, you know, there's about 200 black bear for every one Sasquatch. So in the state of Idaho, we've got about thirty-five thousand black bear, and they're pretty elusive and hard to hard to find, hard to see, um, unless you're. Don't they you're, call them ghost bears? Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, the ghost bears that refers specifically to the to the uh, supposed persistence of grizzly bears in southern Colorado. Oh. But there was a book about black bears in Idaho, and they were called the the shadows in the forest suggesting how elusive they actually are but but the point being for for every uh for so for thirty-five thousand black bear in idaho we've got maybe 
150, 200 Sasquatch by my guesstimation. And it's a little bit better than a guesstimation, but that's a, a rough ballpark. And I, and that, when you add that up across the Western United States and Canada, that provides sufficient, I think, to sustain a population. And yet, you combine that with their rarity, their longevity, their higher intelligence, their uh, far-ranging behaviors, we've got evidence that would suggest that, you know, they may have a home range uh, depending on the topography and the habitat and so forth, on the order of about a thousand square miles. You know, there's, there's, there are bear that will make a living in 20 square miles, literally never, never leave uh, that size of, a, of an area. Huh. Uh, you know, there's a lot of variation in that, obviously, and depending on uh, gender and age and so forth. So do you th- well with with all your expertise? Do you think and and with primates, could they be up in the trees? Are they adapted to go way up in the trees or underground? Because obviously they're strong. Right. Well, the limit the limiting factors would be one their size and two the the uh, the structure of the forest canopy. You know, there's not a lot to attract you uh, up into a conifer. Uh, as opposed to a fig tree in a tropical forest in in the tropical latitudes, most of the most and this is I think why Sasquatch are as big as they are. I mean, if they did need resources up in the trees, um, they would not have attained the giant size that they they have. But that's part of that uh, of the uh, strategy of that size is the ability to use less productive, less. Uh, um, uh, nutritious foodstuffs in order to survive, especially through a winter in a temperate forest. But in a temperate forest, most of the sugars and starches are at the at the ground level or subterranean. You know, roots and tubers and berries, the old roots and berries. And then they are almost certainly omnivorous. And so, taking a an elk fawn or a deer is uh, is uh, has been reported by many a witness, in fact. Sean, do you remember when your dad told you he believed in Bigfoot? Oh, it was a long time that he would just, uh, he wouldn't actually come out and say it. And and people would ask me, does your dad believe? And I would say, well, he's a he's a researcher, so I don't think he's allowed to say whether he believes or not. Because <laughs> then, yeah. then his evidence, whatever he presents, might be attributed to his beliefs. Or, you know, like, like you discussed early on, that scientists don't. They, they often allow their biases to slip into their research. And so I think it's a constant battle to prove that you're not. So when people ask him that, I think, it, I think for a long time, he struggled. And even I would say the same thing, you know, mirror my dad and sound cool, but. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, yeah. And I, and I, uh, religiously, pardon that word, religiously, uh, uh, avoid using the word belief because of the connotation of a position of faith. I mean, it has a uh, very frequently, very routinely, you know, a journalist will ask me, so you believe, you know, incredulously, (laughs) you believe in Bigfoot? And, and I'll set them back on their heels by saying no <laughs> and pause, leave a pregnant pause there for it to sink in and then say, uh, when you ask that, when you use that term in a colloquial sense, you mean, have I accepted something in the absence of evidence? And I say, no, I'm convinced by the evidence that I have studied. I have reached a point where I'm absolutely convinced as, as, as much as I can be short of having a specimen right in front of me, you know, and I qualify it by that, but no, it's not a matter of belief. It, that, that's a pejorative um, skeptics, the ideological skeptic that, that I've talked about call, um, you know, Sasquatch enthusiasts who, those who have, have given all objectivity away, uh, true believers, Hmm. So, you know, a, I had a colleague in my department say, not to my face, but someone else shared it with me. Oh, he believes. So he's no longer objective. He's not doing any right. real scientific research. Hmm. Well, it's like, isn't it like saying, like, I believe in deer or I believe in dogs? It's like, <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, I, I get what you're saying there. It's yeah. it's kind of demeaning, actually, in some ways if, in your research to say, because, I mean, I w- you wouldn't say you believe in deer. I've seen deer. Right. right. I mean, so. Right. If yep. you have seen the evidence of deer, 
I see my dog poop in the backyard all the time without seeing my dog. I know that he's <laughs> around, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it almost feels like you have to go through a pilgrimage in your life to be able to do science, so to speak. Oh yeah. Right. It is. Like what, what, are, what are the things that happened in your life to be able to accept this stuff? Like for me, it took a long time through just listening to podcasts about Bigfoot before, you know, your mind slowly evolves to be accept, accept these things. What's the pilgrimage you took mentally to be able to look at those casts and not just go, someone hoax those things. Like, yeah. To, to, to step past that, to not have that giant wall of skepticism knock you back. Right. The sequence. Well, well, I compare it to fishing in a way. I, I, I enjoy fishing, but I'm, but I'm not a good fisherman because if I don't catch, at least as a youngster in my earlier days, I guess, if I don't catch something right off the bat, I lose interest very quickly and have to go find something else to occupy myself with. But if I catch a fish in that first five minutes, I can sit there not catching anything the rest of the day and be absolutely dedicated to the, to the uh, effort. Mm -hmm. And it's, and so a uh, stroke of uh, good fortune, I guess, or, or, or not, they have to ask Sean if that, if it is or not. <laughs> um, my first in ex exposure was a big fish. I mean, looking at those <laughs> absolutely pristine 15 inch footprints in the mud, strung out there across that hillside like i said that that reaction there there was a, a intellectual but there was also an emotional reaction sasquatch actually walked by here last night but if you put 10 of your colleague friends in there in that space where you were yeah could they look at those tracks and see what you saw well if if they had the uh if they had the uh, understanding of what they were looking at and and didn't and, and weren't just simply um, weighing the question, does this suggest Bigfoot or not? In other words, I mean, I was focused in on the pressure ridges, the tension cracks, the toe slips and drag outs, the comet tails, the, the half tracks, you know, all the, the, the subtlety. It was like a piece of artwork for you. <laughs> like a Picasso. Well, yeah, in a way. It's like a piece you know, of artwork. It, You're talking about the first time you, you saw a woman at the beach and the sun silhouetting on her. Yeah. <laughs> You know, there, there, there's something, uh, there's something to be said about that comment, though, because, um, you know, I'm a very visual learner and teacher. Yeah. And uh, and I think based on experiences with other colleagues who look at something and don't see what I see, you know. Yeah. I mean, we all are that way a little bit, but um, there are there. I'm I'm a very qualitative investigator. And, uh, you know, I've given seminars in my department who, the, where there's a lot of, uh, you know, quantitative ecologists. And if they can't put it on a bivariate plot, they don't know what to do with it. And even what's on the bivariate plot. I, there was one fellow in particular, he, I, I had to laugh. I literally had to suppress a laugh because this is one of, one of the guys that was one of my uh, more vocal antagonists. And, he, he's giving a presentation. He shows this one plot. He says, I have no idea what it means, but there's the data. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, what? You know, and yet when I, when I give this anatomical treatise on the, on the evolution of the human foot and, and the significance, you know, the footprints fossilized and extant, they go, oh, you know, it's all just quantitative. I said, well, you, you put too much stock in qualitative. If, if I put a square and a circle of the same width or diameter up there, and you quantify that with two measurements, right, height and breadth, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between those two things. But without a pair of calipers, I can look at that and describe to you, this one is a circle. Mm -hmm. This one is a square. I mean, that sounds trite, but that's kind of what it boils down to sometimes. You know, I, uh, I one of my complaints about some of my colleagues, some of my younger colleagues who uh, have made quite a splash in the, in the foot morphology literature is that they don't um, uh, understand the mechanics of footprints. They've never, they, they don't, at least there's no evidence that they've ever spent a day at the beach just watching people walk and examining their footprints over and over yeah. and over again. Funny you mention that. You know, I still have my cast of my foot that you took on the beach. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, yeah. Look at that. Here, here's a story. Here's a, <laughs> here's a story of, of how that kind of thing happens. My uh, ex-wife, my former wife, and I were sitting watching a movie. And uh, she hates it when I tell the story, but uh, it's okay now. I don't have to have permission. <laughs> <laughs> she has a foot that, uh, and, uh, and Sean can tell you about this trait too, because most of the boys have it as well. She has very nimble toes that she can bend under her foot so that her foot looks almost like a fist. The toes are bent under so far. I, I cannot even come close to doing that. Her toes aren't exceptionally long, and her sole pad actually comes up almost to the first interphalangeal joint right there. So when seen from below, her toes look actually rather short and stubby. You wouldn't think they were, were so, so flexible. The, uh, the story was that uh, we're, we're sitting there at the couch and I'm on the floor. She's on the couch with her leg over my shoulder because I'm giving her, you know, one of my famous foot massages. And uh, the movie, I don't remember what movie, <laughs> what movie we were watching, but I was losing interest in it. And my mind started to wander and I was thinking about footprints. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, <laughs> one of the characteristics of, the, of some Sasquatch tracks is they have this unusual sort of crease across the ball of the foot. It's been described as split ball, and there's been several different attempts to explain what it might be or what the adaptation might, might uh, signify. Well, I'm sitting there with my wife's foot, and suddenly I thought to myself, you know, I've never seen the, her or the sole of her foot when her toes are bent down. And so I bent her foot down, and lo and behold, right across the ball of her foot pops up this crease, a flexion crease right at the joint. And it was very prominent on her because her sole pad extends up uh, but, you know, under the toes and between the toes uh, to a greater degree, just as our fingers are webbed so that when we flex our our knuckles, that crease pops up. And that's that. there was the answer. <laughs> if you go and, and look at your uh, baby uh, birth certificate, that is, your birth certificate, if you've got an inked footprint, what you'll find, and this is why I was casting the kid's feet, you'll find that there's a crease right across the ball of your foot. We're all born with one. It, huh. only, it only fills in as we begin to walk and crawl and so forth. And and the uh, sole pad continues to grow, and it, the connective tissue fills in. Sean, have you ever about, have you ever been out with your dad, and he complimented a woman on her feet? My, <laughs> you have beautiful feet. <laughs> I just I just picture I picture you guys at the beach, and your dad is following you around as you're walking, no, like, looking at he, each of your footprints. He does. He <laughs> says, "Can you can you run twenty yards down yeah. the beach?" And then he starts yeah. looking at our pictures. Uh, or our feet footprints and that happened in fact so my foot is actually in my dad's book sasquatch legend Read science i could tell you the page i was actually just looking for it but uh i've i've jokingly because i used to go i went to comic-con twice with my dad and helped them sell told somebody while trying to convince them to buy my dad's book that my foot was in there and so he actually had me sign his book <laughs> and my dad, so that he could give both of our signatures. So did you did you sign the footprint? He, uh, I didn't sign the cast. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I mean like in the, in the book because your picture. Is, oh yeah, yeah. You'll find that's I, awesome. But I signed it for him. It's not in every book. Maybe we should make that yeah. happen, but I don't think it's in every book. Yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Sounds like a second level perk, right? You know, yeah. I'll yeah. sign my foot in there. Extra five dollars. It goes to. Exactly. Uh, well, see that uh, on that trip. I I think it was you, Sean. I took Sean up uh, on a little camping trip. We went up to a reservoir that I knew had a big, expansive sandbar at the one end, and that's what we did. We camped on the beach, and then, and then all day I would have, <laughs> I'd have him run down to the beach and back, or I'd have him run in a circle to the left or a circle to the right, yep. and and a jump, and and uh, uh, then I I took photographs and made casts, representative casts. Wow. footprints and there some people go part of fishing with their dads and others <laughs> <laughs> others go running through the sandbars <laughs> i mean i have to ask you know with all this evidence and all this love i mean you have like pure love for this subject and is it heartbreaking to think that you will go the rest of your life and maybe never see one of these beasts and are is, is the goal to see one <laughs> you said that very delicately uh, yeah uh, uh, yeah, no, I know. I'm, I'm reaching that point. You know, the, 
the white uh, gray hair has accumulated now to the point that I'm uh, experiencing some of those same emotions that I'm sure my predecessors like Dr. Krantz did, where, uh, you know, I, I hope to see this resolved. Um, you know, I, I try to get out in the woods to do field work in, uh, in the summer months when I can and, and, uh, and hope to continue doing that on, in one form or another. Um, in the future, but uh, yeah, I would, I, I certainly hope, and I, I'm certainly not, I'm not ready to throw in the towel. Well, I mean, once you, re if you ever retired, I mean, you can go out, do it full time. Sure. Right? Well, yeah, um, there's that, uh, that. You probably up your chances at that right. point, right? Yeah. I, I feel like you're going to have your Harry and Henderson's moment where it's going to come out and you're going to have a real intimate moment. He's going to give you a hug. Yeah, there you go. Get yeah. in a station wagon. <laughs> you guys drive off. Tossle your hair a little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, one question I had, I just, I know we're winding down here, but one question I had too about, about the body thing. I know we're going back to that and about actually finding it. Jeff, do you think, do you think there's a, I know there's theories out there about Bigfoot actually burying their dead. Do you think that that's something that is likely or unlikely? It may just be a dumb question, but. No, no, it's not, it's not a dumb question at all. And, and I, I and I certainly uh, wouldn't profess to know for certain one way or the other, my my sense is that it's probably um, unlikely simply because all the evidence seems to point to these creatures being very solitary. Okay. When sightings or footprints are found, it's of single individuals or what we take to be females with, with dependent offspring still in tow. You know, we've got little footprints. That's something people don't realize. We have, you know, the smallest footprint I have is about three and a half inches. And... Uh, it's it's remarkable looking, but all the way on up to you know the longest I've got is about 19 inches. That's credible, and wow. so I I think when a when an animal in that kind of a social structure gets old and decrepit, um, I mean it's possible that they then call and attract others to their assistance. Maybe that's you know that's not beyond the realm of possibility. Does any other animal bury its dead? Is there any? There's not, no, that, that buries mm. their, in fact, even our own lineage, you know, there's a lot of controversy about even the, quote, Neanderthal burials, whether they were intentional burials or just um, cave-ins, basically, you know, um, or pushing so much garbage into the crevice and covering it with dirt so it didn't smell during the winter months and that kind of thing. But um, uh, I think it much more likely that as as most animals do, um, they just secrete themselves off to some nook or cranny. I mean, it's kind of like you, you think back to the old legends of the elephant graveyard mm -hmm. where they thought there was some mystical place where the elephants all went to die. And if you could find that, you would be rich with all the ivory you could collect. When in reality, uh -huh. all it was was the elephants would go off somewhere out of the way, they would die. And then if you've ever seen one of those time-lapse videos of an yeah. elephant carcass and within two weeks i mean it's gone there's not even a grease spot left because everything gets carted off and eaten or chewed up and gnawed up and and where sasquatch presumably resides in these wet coniferous forests the soils are notoriously acidic um, plus in the pacific northwest there's a lot of volcanism and so that adds to the acidity of the soil bone just does not fare well in acidic conditions like that and so anything that's exposed to the elements that isn't chewed up by the squirrels and marmots and porcupines uh very quickly deteriorates so you just you don't you know you don't find bones very often out in the woods i have to ask one last question what's the weirdest story that you heard that you thought could be true about sasquatch Ooh, let's see the weirdest it just stuck with you yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've heard a few uh, and they stuck with me. Yeah, I mean, the ones that I would place any, any possible credibility, and I guess the one that kind of jumps to mind is um, uh, the, one of the classic stories, the, the uh, Ostman tale of being carted off in his sleeping bag by a Sasquatch and unceremoniously dumped uh, on the ground in the presence of what seemed to be a a unit, a social unit, whether it was a nuclear family or just a, an interloping male and a female with her offspring. Oh, interloping. Uh, oh, this yeah. could have been a scandal. <laughs> it, well, it could have. I mean, one, one of the thoughts was, you know, it was like, uh, you know, you, you treat your, 
your your lovey dovey to dinner before the fun starts. So maybe <laughs> Ostman was the dinner. Right. And, and, hey, look what look what I brought you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously he uh, he Water. was harassing Austin for for two or three days, so he wasn't hanging out with the female and her offspring. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then he carried Osman all night long, so he had to cover probably 20, 25, 30 miles wow. that night. And so he wasn't uh, he wasn't in the neighborhood. And right, exactly. Men don't yeah. do that without purpose. <laughs> right, married, married men don't do that, right? <laughs> well, I mean, my, my point is just simply the people look at that, and here's mom and, you know, daddy bear, mama bear, and baby bear. It, it probably was not a nuclear family. It was... Yeah. Uh, it still fits the notion that I think the evidence overwhelmingly points to that that they're largely solitary in their behavior. But males and females do. I mean, given the apparent age of the two offspring that were described, they were kind of teenage male and female individuals. Um, they clearly were weaned, yeah. and so perhaps the female yeah. was receptive to some male company hey. uh, again. Um, you know, orangutans, for example, they only uh, get pregnant about every six or seven years. And so there's quite a birth interval in, in these large bodied apes. And uh, Sasquatches, we're kind of the exception. We've evolved back the other direction to where, you know, we can pop one out while the other one's still right. attached. <laughs> what about you, Sean? Same question. And then we can wrap it up. Ooh. Um,. I oh, the stories that I would hear about Native American babies who developed, you know, who were colicky or, or sick. I can't remember where this story came from. It's probably been handed around a couple times, and um, obviously Sasquatch was drawn to it, and and uh, try, I can imagine it vividly because I remember watching yeah, a yeah. Yeti movie with my dad where these right. these big hands right. creep under yeah. the tent and grab the it's rifles classic Yeti, and break Yeti them. Movie, yeah. You remember the movie, Dad? Yeah. That still, it gives me chills to this day. But them telling the story of this, this Sasquatch, and I'm pretty sure a Native American resident of yeah. the tribe, that told me the story and you, re they reached under the tent and grabbed this baby and just scooped it off and ran away. And so all they had, all they saw was um, these hands and that, that gives me the chills to this day. But yeah. yeah. Here's a, here's a funny, uh, funny extension of that story. And, and I'll, I'll be delicate because, uh, because the tribes are, they don't like this aspect discussed too much, but um, I was uh uh, one of one of my grandchildren, not not Wade, that poked his head in, but his <laughs> his older sister um, arranged for me to to speak at her kindergarten class, and so I brought a big box with all these skulls and foot skeleton models and footprint casts and all kinds of things, and we're passing these around. The kids were just mesmerized. It was great. But then the teacher's aide. She, she starts asking me questions and got me kind of distracted, and I'm answering, and, and one of her questions was, are they dangerous? And I said, well, you know, most, almost all of, with, with very few exceptions, um, and those exceptions involve the humans shooting at the Sasquatch, the encounters are very innocuous. I mean, they're, they're downright boring, in fact, except for the sensation of running into a nine-foot-tall, hairy <laughs> biped, hairy giant. But uh, but then I, I, I slipped over and I says, but you know, it's interesting that the local uh, tribes have traditions and one of their names is um, uh, translates to the eater of children. Yeah. And it goes back to this story that um, Sean was referring to where uh, during a very cold winter, this big hairy arm came in and snatched the crying baby out from under the teepee. And then yeah. I suddenly realized where I was. And you could hear a pin drop, and all these little faces are looking up at me. <laughs> eat, they eat children, and so very, very deftly the Whoops. the teacher. Yeah, I know the teacher uh, very deftly swooped in, and she says, "Oh, but these are just native uh, stories. They're, these are like fairy tales, like Hansel and Gretel, you know." Yeah. And I go, "Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right." Yeah, yeah. Well, a few a week later, I got a stack of thank you notes. 
yes, from yes, yes, um, yes. you know Parents. from the uh, uh, the class, and a, a sizable <laughs> number of them said. Thank you, Dr. Meldrum. I learned that Sasquatch eat children. <laughs> <laughs> so thankfully, no parents called me. But, uh. <laughs> but there yeah, will be really... about 15 kids growing up with that notion. Right. <laughs> Never yeah. going camping, ever. Yeah. Never going yeah, camping, I mean, ever. I mean, we haven't gotten to that too much on our uh, podcast yet, but there is a lot of the missing 411 stuff that, you know, yeah. Sasquatch could be involved in that. And I think parents yeah. should know that they shouldn't probably let their kids run around unassisted in the woods. Well, sure. Well, sure. I mean, there's there's 200 times more chance they'll get snatched by a bear than a right. Sasquatch, but yeah. sure, nevertheless, sure. You, you need to show respect for the wildlife, that's for sure. Yeah, well, we appreciate you guys coming on the show, dropping some stories, you know, everything from Bigfoot butt cheeks yeah. to... Yeah. <laughs> With the hair, with the hair striations. I just thinking. Yeah. <laughs> something about I played. I played football with some guys. <laughs> Who had some hair striations? I think would have would have fit the mold. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, Look at that. Uh, hey, plenty. Yeah, plenty of dad jokes. We were gonna. We were, we joked about you know saying like as many trying to pepper in as many dad jokes and foot jokes as we could. And I or, thought, yeah, or just like foot puns. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to backtrack a little bit here. No. Um, yeah, so is there any place you, you, you point people, Jeff, to like uh, a website or anywhere to like um, oh. to get involved with what you're doing? Well, uh, not specifically. I, I, you know, I don't have a web page devoted to this topic uh, per se. So I, I, or some I, books I get asked, or anything. Yeah, I, certainly I would uh, encourage people to get hold of the book or the field guide. It's an excellent place to start. There are others out there that are, are informative as well. But that really is, I think, is, is a great starting point for most people. And, uh, and, and especially it's, it's grounded. It'll give you a good solid treatment uh, of the subject from a biological, anthropological perspective. And, yeah. uh, and check out the Relic Hominoid Inquiry that you mentioned. It's, it's a open access journal. It's a little more uh, heady uh, because that they are uh, academically um, directed journal articles, but there's a lot of great information and they're they're profuse. The nice thing about being online, no page charges, and so they're profusely illustrated with you know color figures in many cases, and so it's a great place to kind of uh, get uh, uh, additional perspectives. Well. I appreciate that. I appreciate you guys coming on, and we hope, we really hope, and we'll be thinking about you, that you'll get to see your Sasquatch one so day. <laughs> and uh, maybe one of these days when Luke and I are out out there, if this show gets big enough, we'll, we, we'd love to, uh, we've, we've already been invited on several Bigfoot uh, journeys. And with thought, uh, man, with alleged on very high rates of success. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, if we yeah. find out this well. is real, I mean, the, the, they're not this is real, but the, the numbers are real. We may have to extend some invites. Uh, also, if you guys end up in Tennessee, uh, coffee, <laughs> beer, have a nice whiskey collection. Would love to. Would love to. Uh, love to see you guys if you're down okay. this way. And I know well, Idaho, wait, Idaho State too. I didn't get to address this. Idaho State, Benny the Bangle, ho- like home of Jared Allen, Merrill Hodge, Marvin. You guys have a great illustrious. I, I'm a football guy. Football history. Also home yeah. of uh, Jeff Meldrum. So uh, there you go. Great to have you guys. And, Just, and if you come, if you come to the lab, I can guarantee you a footprint cast sighting. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I got a size fourteen. I, I want to see it. how I measure up. <laughs> oh wow! Well, I'll have to make a I'll have to make a mold of your foot. There we go. I'm ready. It's gonna be ugly, man. I got some. I got, got some I've been stepped on. Hair striations on your foot. Yeah, yeah I, well, I'm not. I'm not gonna promise a massage. No, no just, I appreciate that. Just a mold. I may sit, try to sit down in a mold too and see how I measure up as well. There you go. <laughs> Well, guys, we totally appreciate it. Sean, thanks so much. This is this has been a treat. This has been fun. Uh, we appreciate it, guys. I know it's a little bit crazy. Thinking, what are these guys up to? What do they want? Why do they want both of us on this show? So we appreciate the open mindedness. Oh, I think it's great. It's been fun. Hey, we've yeah. had several. Uh, we've had several overtures from uh, from production companies to possibly do it. You know, a documentary series with me and the boys, oh, or iterations of the boys. Yeah. But it's mm. just you know, the, it's the logistics of it. Yeah. Even if the idea uh, falls on favorable uh, ears with the uppity ups, but uh, the higher ups, 
the logistics of it are just kind of insurmountable. But it would be fun. That would be really fun. To do. Yeah, I, I think it would probably yeah. make a lot a lot of guys that can't grow beers very insecure too. So there may be some backlash. <laughs> <to> it. <laughs> it's true. Absolutely, yeah, I love it. All right, guys. Yeah. Thanks right. so much. You bet. So yeah, I thanks. appreciate it. Right. Take right. care. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. So that was it. That was uh, the Bigfoot scientist, the rock star of the Bigfoot world when in terms of the data, the footprints, and you name it. And uh, we got him to open up and have some, you know, share him, share a side of himself that we hope you've never heard on a Bigfoot show before. Because, you know, right away we have a lot of people who've listened to Jeff Meldrum on several things, from documentaries to podcasts. We, we try to go for something different on this show. Get people to share their stories, where they come from, how they get, how they get there why they believe what they not even believe in, as we learned in this episode right. just uh, just where they move past belief into a understanding so to speak of this of this this creature and or creatures as we're learning yeah i'm with you i think, I think it's fascinating to to parse out the academic side from the, from the human side really and and get a full picture of you know of of these experts i think i think we got a lot of that with yeah, I guess so. Guys like Brian Forrester and Fritz Zimmerman, and being able to really get you know get the human look at these at these guys that are, are top flight researchers in, in the things that they research, whether it be burial mounds or the Paracas skulls, or in Jeff Meldrum's case, you know all of the foot morphology evidence for for Bigfoot for Sasquatch, and to get mm. to see the side of you know growing up in. In a family like that, I just think the entire the entire picture is fascinating, and you know I think there's been enough cut and dry um, academic discussions with Jeff. You know I've seen him like before I ever like you know wa- forever watched Finding Bigfoot or got into this topic uh, to the level that I guess we are now. Uh, I, I knew his face from seeing him in in you know encrypted shows on uh, Discovery Channel, History Channel. I mean he, he's been everywhere. So really yeah. cool to have like one of the big dogs, maybe the goat, when it comes to uh, Bigfoot, uh, come on the show uh, and just yeah. sort of break it down for us. It was awesome. Just break it down for us about you know his journey, and I, I think it's fascinating to find that turning point for when the light, you know, the, the switch and the light bulb turned on for him. It's it's not what you expect, but it is what you expect, right? For a guy that's you know in into biomechanics and foot mor- foot morphology and, and footprints and all these you know all the things that he's into to be sitting in front of what would be his Mona Lisa in a sense is what yeah. you expect but also not what you expect right I mean it's yeah super interesting yeah and I loved it it was cool and it's funny to like you know to have real conversations with people you've listened to for years it's always fun to kind of have an idea of like this this person seems cool this person seems down to earth and then have an idea in your head, like let's bring his son on, have a family affair, and it go so well and be what you kind of envisioned. Mm-hmm. That was just really special and really cool. And uh, we hope you guys enjoy this episode. Once again, if you uh, listen to the show, you like it, please go and review it right now on iTunes. That's really helpful. Um, give it five stars, leave a review, and just share us on Instagram or Facebook. Just say, hey, I, I'm loving this show. Put a you know logo of us or whatever tag us at blurry creatures on anything just help us get the word out that really helps us grow this show and get more guests on and really bring these stories to life because that's what we're all about is chasing a different aspect of um, the characters behind these creatures no yeah but leave us a review this is something that doesn't take takes two seconds out of your day we read them all you don't even have to leave us any any comment go on there and leave us a review it really helps us get the word out and you know you've got to you, in these in these arenas and mediums you got to play the game and it really helps us grow what we're doing here listen tell nate he's great because nate is great and uh <laughs> and he really loves to hear it <laughs> thanks man i appreciate it i, th- I thrive on the juice you and, gotta give uh, him that juice. i had fun give him that juice guys I, that was cool man i don't where do we go from here man he's the legend he's the top dog so what do we do now you know uh, should we start another podcast about like knitting or something i think we've we're, we, we can shut it down <laughs> yeah yeah this is it we're done Kidding. guys we, no we're not <laughs> well anyway thanks for listening to the show we appreciate it 
I'm Nate. And I'm Luke. And Nate once went on tour with the band Hanson. <laughs> See you next time.